morning, everyone. It's a great pleasure to be here. I'm going to tell you a story about a new light source unlike anything you have ever seen before. Um, and the light, and I will also tell you about the type of light we are using uh, to see the invisible, because the light itself is invisible. When you think about light, you typically uh, think about the visible part of the light. And a beautiful example is a rainbow, which is caused by having droplets of water diffract the rays of the sun into their spectral components. But in fact, there are many other forms of light. The electromagnetic spectrum, uh, which itself is very large, encompasses even much more. You can have radio waves where the wavelength is as long as one kilometer. Uh, you use electromagnetic waves to heat up your milk or your hot dog uh, because these, this, this is about centimeter long waves. They bring the water molecules to vibrate and so they heat up things. Then you yourself emit infrared light and snakes, for example, at night, they can detect infrared light to see the body of a warm mouse in compared to the environment around. Then, as you just saw with the rainbow, there's a small part of the electromagnetic spectrum which is actually the visible light. You go uh, to yet higher energies, shorter wavelengths, you come into the UV light, uh, which is also what gives you a sunburn. And then you get into the range of X-rays. And finally, the, the highest energy are gamma rays. Now, Wilhelm Röntgen, was a physicist, and he experimented and discovered on a cardboard, which was supposed to be black, uh, there was supposed to be no light, that it was fluorescing. He didn't know what to make of it, and then he studied it more and more, and uh, shortly, on, on December 28, 1895, he wrote a paper. He called it on a new kind of rays. What Röntgen had discovered was a kind of rays kind of ray, a kind of light which can penetrate. And this is the first uh, image he took with this new light. He called it X-rays because X is the mathematical symbol for the unknown, a little bit like your TEDx uh, name here. And uh, somehow the name X stuck and it was never changed. Uh, the discovery changed medicine uh, completely. Röntgen got the first Nobel Prize in physics in 1901 and he got Shortly after his discovery, he got an honorary uh, doctorate degree in medicine as well. Now, you are very familiar with, uh, with x-rays. Uh, you can see, for example, to the left, uh, an x-ray of a pregnant woman. Uh, if you are lucky, your teeth look like this. Uh, or if you are checking in at the airport, a typical airport scanner uh, might de detect something like that. Um, but you should understand that there are many other properties of x-rays which are unique. One of the most important properties of x-rays is the wavelength is so short that it is of the same length scales as atoms and molecules. Therefore, you can use x-rays not only to look through things, but you can use x-rays to study incredibly small things. This photo was taken in 1952 by a young British scientist with the name of Rosalind Franklin. Uh, it is an incredibly important photograph uh, because it led to one of the greatest discoveries of the 20th century. Now, Rosalind Franklin uh, took uh, this photo as a diffraction, an X-ray diffraction image of a crystal made out of DNA molecules. And with the help of this photo, and she actually identified a lot of things, but eventually with the help of this photo, um, James Watson and Francis Crick uh, solved the structure of the molecule of light, the structure of the DNA molecule. In particular, they found how the base pairs are facing each other on the inside of this double helical ball. Um, the technique which was used for this amazing discovery, and in fact, Crick uh, at a pub when they submitted, had submitted the paper, he announced, I think we just found the molecule of light. Uh, the technique they used is different than your normal X-ray scanner. What they did is they 
uh, you, they made a crystal, so Rosalind Franklin made a crystal of millions of identical molecules, and they sent this X-ray beam and diffracted, and from the diffraction image and some other information, they were able uh, to reconstruct this molecule. Now, this technique has been used si ever since, and is a very, very important technique, and um, it has really changed our life. A lot of new medications have, have been discovered, like Tamiflu, uh, the, H1, uh, the HIV virus, and others have been discovered by using X-ray diffraction. It is uh, many, many of the uh, pharmaceutical companies uh, rely on their very latest product by using this technique. Now, X-rays have another property. They, can, uh, they are sensitive to different elements. Uh, and here I can show you an X-ray spectrum. And you can see, if you go up the periodic table, you can see all these elements which are present. In this particular case, you have phosphorus, chlorine, calcium, etc. You can use X-rays to study not just what these elements are, but you can also use X-rays to study um, the local environment of these elements in a very powerful way, so you can tell where a certain element sits. And uh, this has led to many, many applications uh, around the years. Uh, you can study superconductivity, you can study uh, magnetism, you can study, you can learn how to build a better flat screen TV. Uh, and, and all of these techniques are using very powerful X-ray sources now, large X-ray sources, unlike the ones which you have at a, let's say, at a dentist or a doctor's office. Now, this technique, uh, th this particular spectrum happens to be taken from an unusual sample. In fact, it was taken uh, on a spot of this page, which turns out, uh, which is the first page of an amazing book uh, called the Archimedes Palimpsest. It contains the by far oldest surviving copy of work by Archimedes. The problem with this page is you cannot read it. Everything, anything you see comes from the overwritten text because this parchment was overwritten and, uh, and the original writings underneath were, were invisible. But using the iron, so the fluorescence, the X-ray spectroscopy which I showed you, together with an imaging technique, scientists were able uh, recently at SLAC to actually uncover all the writings on here. And they discovered uh, the, this page contains the final proposition uh, of Archimedes' very important work on floating bodies, and it's the only time uh, uh, scholars have seen it in the original Greek. Now, I gave you a couple of examples of the X-ray, uh, and I should say that most of the use of X-rays, even scientific use of X-rays today, with the most powerful sources, and there are many of those around the world, have focused on taking still images. The DNA, even though you see it rotating, the molecule of life, it's really a still image of the DNA. Um, this is certainly a still image and many other ones as well. Um, this new source, which I will introduce you in a minute, will attempt something new. It will attempt to be able to use x-rays to make movies. Now let me talk a little bit about movies and what you, what you need to know about the speed of making a movie. If you were to take a photograph of a hummingbird, and one of those could be just outside at one of those plants, and you took your iPhone, you would never be able to see actually the movement of the, of the wings of the hummingbird. Uh, in order to do that, you need a camera speed which can give you a thousand images per second, because these hummingbirds, they can flap their wings as fast as 200 times per second. So you need a very fast movie. Now, if you were to make a movie of a bullet, for example, piercing through an object, like in this case through an apple, you would need a, a camera speed of a million images per second. Because otherwise, the whole thing is just smeared out and you're not going to see anything. Now, think about that. A million, so make a million images per second. If you play that in normal speed, it'll take quite a long time just to, to watch one second go by. Um, if you were to make a movie of a water molecule, and I would like to remind you, the DNA is the molecule of life, but so is water, because as far as we know today, life is not possible without liquid water, and we really don't yet understand very well how liquid water is actually structured. 
We understand the water molecule very well. This is oxygen, the two hydrogens, but we don't really know very well how it is structured in the liquid state and how it surrounds actually, for example, the DNA molecule or any other molecule. Now, water molecules, uh, they vibrate. Uh, and in order to make a movie of this vibration, you would need to have a camera speed 100 million times faster even than the one to capture a bullet uh, going through an apple. And that's the kind of camera we have now built at Slack, four and a half miles uh, northwest from here. Uh, and that camera is not just making, not just being able to make extremely fast movies, it's also going to use x-rays, which are able, as I explained to you before, to make movies of objects that are incredibly small. And so now, uh, I'll just show you first where Slack is. Um, this is the Linux. Uh, this is Highway 280, and we are about, as I just said, four and a half miles uh, away uh, on, on basically in this direction. If you ever drive over Highway uh, 280 and you cross Slack, um, turn to, to your left if you go north, it's an amazing view. It's the longest building in the world. And we are using part of this long accelerator uh, as the source for our X-ray laser. Um, Slack is funded by the Department of Energy and it's operated by Stanford University. We are on Stanford land. We are all Stanford employees. And so I would like you now to fasten your seatbelt to go with me through um, the explanation of uh, LCLS, the Linear Coherent Light Source, our X-ray laser, and I would like to maybe start the movie now. So this is again the schematics of the Linux, and we are going to start our journey right here. This is the building we will go underground, about 20 feet underground. A, an ultraviolet laser shoots uh, light onto a copper target. In each shot, it knocks out a burst of about a billion electrons. These electrons now are accelerated, first to the side, and then go straight into the linear accelerator, which is one of the most powerful accelerators there is. Uh, they, they gather energy and speed up to about 15 giga electron volt. That's the maximum energy they have by, by racing down these, uh, this track. Each, at each of those little points, they gain more energy. And then they come into the heart of the X-ray laser uh, after going through another transport hall. Uh, at this point, the X-rays are forced onto a slalom track. And you will see that in a second. Um, when, an X, when an electron is moved sideways, it starts to send out x-rays uh, at each of those crests on the side. Now these x-rays, as, as they wiggle more and more and more, get more and more intense, and finally they start to interact with the electrons, bunch the electrons into short bunches, and get an enhancement by another factor of one billion and come out. At this point, electrons and x-rays travel together, and we don't need the electrons, so they are discarded by a big magnet. They go into the ground. The x-rays continue their travel and go into the experimental station. We have six experimental stations at, at the LCLS, three in the front, three in the back. Each of those stations uh, is capable of housing users around uh, uh, all year round, and they have instruments which look like this, and the users, they bring their samples and they put them into the X-ray beam uh, where it's then studied uh, to do the research. Um, now, this is a real view of actually the heart of the X-ray laser where these electrons are on a slalom track and creating x-rays. One of the important things to note is the LCLS is a very elegant machine because the total power is actually not that high. The total power of a light bulb like here is much higher than that of the LCLS. But the LCLS makes such short pulses that the power you can get when the pulse arrives is just unbelievable. You, we can focus it down to a micron and if you compare that power which is in that one micron size at the short time when the pulse arrives is as much power as if you were to take all the sunlight hitting the earth, focusing it down into a one centimeter square spot. It's an amazing power. It's actually a destructive power. So what we, we are aware that the LCLS can destroy the samples, but since the pulses are so short, we can get an image of the, of the object we study before it explodes. And I'll show you, uh, how this experiment works. This is 
uh, an experiment, we call it probe before destroy, uh, and it has already been applied. The LCLS has only started for a little bit more than a year, and I'm going to show you the next movie to give you the concept of that. So we drop molecules or, or crystals into the beam and they, they, they are hit by the X-rays, and even though they explode, as you can see the explosion, the, the it's short enough that they get a structure, uh, an intact structure of uh, the object you study, and then you can reconstruct it and you can get the image of it. Uh, for this reason, for the reason that you probe so fast, you can now study live objects. With conventional X-ray sources before, you always had to uh, freeze them and, and crystallize them, and, uh, and there were, was damage involved because it took much longer to take a measurement. Now you can actually really study live objects. And one of the first experiments, this was just published in Nature uh, in February, was to look at a large virus um, with X-rays. And here you see one of those X-ray diffraction images from a single X-ray shot before the virus explodes. And the scientists have used several hundred of those images and then were able to reconstruct. Uh, this is a reconstructed image now of a MIMI virus. And you can see that there is some structure on the inside. This is the first experiment. They are going to improve it and they hope that very soon they will be able to learn uh, with, with much higher resolution of the, the inner workings of a virus. And this might open the door to an enormous amount of research. So I would like to finish by uh, saying that the LCLS at SLAC is starting a new era of fundamental science where we hope to study chemistry, uh, the formation and um, breaking of bonds on the natural time scale and on the natural length scale, really on the atomic length scale and on the ultra fast time scale. Furthermore, we will attempt to study uh, fundamental speed limits. For example, how fast can you switch a magnet uh, in order, for example, to store some, uh, store some information on a chip. Uh, because we are far, right now, even with the fastest devices, we are far from, from the speed limit. Um, and um, we want to also understand how liquids like water, how it really looks like in the transient state. So can we take a real snapshot, several snapshots, and see what happens with all the water molecules in real time? And finally, and that would be really groundbreaking for the 21st century, we would use this device to try to understand the chemistry of life in real time. And I would all like to invite you, when you have a chance, come and visit the X-ray laser. Thank you very much. <laughs>